9 through verse number 22. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 17 through verse 22 tonight. Let me just remind you, go back even before we read verse 17. Let me look at verse number 1. Uh, Peter here under the inspiration of the Spirit of God is dealing with false prophets. If you see in verse number one, he says there were false prophets. We've been preaching about these false prophets. Last week we brought a message on characteristics of the counterfeit. And um, so now we pick it up in verse 17 through the end of the chapter in verse number 22. So verse 17, uh, Peter describes these. He says, these are are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the midst the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those those that were clean escape from them that live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. For it is after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, then after they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. With that verse number 22, I want to preach on this thought tonight, sick dogs and dirty hogs. Sick hogs, sick dogs, excuse me, and dirty hogs. He closes off this chapter by saying that these are like the dog that turns to his own vomit again and the sow that grows back to the mire. I'm old enough to remember my dad getting the newspaper on Sunday. How many of you grew up with a newspaper in your home? All right. How many of you remember that the Sunday paper, well, you kids, you pay attention, right? Learn something about it, amen. But the Sunday paper was the biggest paper of the week, right? And I, as a kid, uh, could not care less about most of the paper. I had interest in a couple of things. I had interest in the sports page, but I had an interest in the comics. Yeah. Frank's with me on that, right? right. 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 And uh, we were a connoisseur of the comics. Well, and one of uh, such comics, and perhaps it's still away, I don't know, I don't get the newspaper, I got the newspaper in years. When I moved to Bessemer, I thought, I need to know what this town's all about, so I got the Newcastle News for 13 weeks. Brother Bill, you know what I did for 13 weeks? <laughs> Threw it on a pile. When it was done, I had 13 weeks piled up. And then they called me back because it was an introductory rate. And they said, you want, you want to re-enroll? I said, I didn't want the first 13 weeks, amen? Amen. I want, didn't want the newspaper. But I like the comics. And probably my favorite, one of my favorites, is the Peanuts comics. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? Charlie Brown, Linus, Snoopy, and Lucy, and all the rest. This is a true cartoon. Now, this was literally a caption. You can look it up for yourself, as I did. But one of the peanut cartoons was a picture of Lucy and Linus looking out the window, and it was raining like crazy. And Lucy said to Linus in that particular uh, cartoon, she says, do you think it's going to rain and flood the entire world? Linus said, oh no, it'll never do that. God said in Genesis chapter 9 that he will only destroy the world once with a flood and he set a rainbow in the sky as a promise that it'll never happen again. 
Lucy said, that sure takes a load off my shoulders. And Linus said, sound doctrine has a way of doing that. Amen. <laughs> I like that. I wonder if they can print that today, but anyways. And sound doctrine surely does do that, doesn't it? Tonight we're preaching about sick dogs and dirty hogs. We have been preaching about plastic preachers. Pseudo prophets. Peter dealt with these in his day, and we deal with them in our day. And you better have some sound doctrine. You better know what you believe. That's why we have Sunday school around here. It's Sunday morning and Sunday night and Monday night and Wednesday night and Thursday night. So you know what you believe and why you believe it from the Word of God. And no wonder the Bible says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Peter, as you can tell in this chapter, he's, he's not joking around here. He has a burning in his soul. He's not casual about this. He's very serious about what he's preaching here and warning them about it in 2 Peter chapter 2. Because he knows, I believe, and we all should know how destructive a lie is. And the biggest lies are about the biggest subject. And that, of course, is Almighty God. Again, these people, as I've already preached, these people are not mistaken. We've all been mistaken, all right? People, uh, Peter here is talking about apostates, are you listening tonight, who are willfully wicked. Willfully wicked. They know full well what they're doing. They know full well that they have rejected the truth of God's word. They're not mistaken. Uh, they have been, uh, they've seen the truth, they have turned from the truth, and now they are preaching and believing a lie. Let's look at four things from 2 Peter chapter 2 tonight. First of all, notice with me, uh, number one from verse 17, we see the explanation of false teachers. Peter here explains these false teachers in verse 17. If you look at it, please, he says, these are, here's how he describes them. He says, first of all, they are wells without water. And then he says, they are clouds they're, that are carried with a tempest. And then he says, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For understanding, let me give it to you this way. First of all, Peter, number one, he talks about these false teachers. First of all, he says they are waterless wells. They are waterless wells. Now, what does a waterless well speak of? Well, a waterless well... Right down the side, I'm going to give you a letter D with a, beside all three of these. A waterless well, right down this word, is the word disappointment. They are a disappointment because here's the thing. God puts inside of every one of us a thirst. I believe with all my heart that there is a thirst for God in every single human soul. Every person has a thirst for God. Now here's the thing. The Bible says that there are those who are thirsting for God and they are going to a well where they think there is going to be water. And the Bible says that they are a well without water. There is no water and it is dried up. What Peter is saying here is that these apostates offer much, but they give very little. They give very little to a thirsty soul. And how sad, and Sister Natalie, if I can uh, piggyback off of your testimony, how sad it is to go week after week and leave a church with a thirsty soul. Miss Val, leaving week after week, having religion, you having religion, week after week, going to church, looking, looking for, uh, there's a thirst in your soul. There's a thirst in their soul. There's a thirst that God put inside of them, but they go week after week after week, and they are just, they come out just as dry and just as thirsty as when they went in. Yeah. How sad that is. The apostates offer much. But they give very little to a thirsty soul. Aren't you glad that Jesus said over there uh, in, the, in the Gospels, he said, whosoever drinketh of this water, speaking of himself, hallelujah, shall never thirst again. Amen. But Jesus said, if you drink of this water that, that you're drinking from, you will thirst again. But you'll never thirst when you 
find your satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll never be disappointed in Jesus. And so the first thing he tells us tonight is that these apostates are like waterless wells. The second thing tonight he wants you to see is he says they are like dusty clouds. He says clouds that are carried with a tempest. The letter, the word that starts with D on this word, if the wells speaks of uh, uh, disappointment, these clouds um, speak of deception. Deception. Because here it is, notice these, these clouds are, are carried away by the tempest. Now what do you know from your Bible? You know that in, in the Bible times, matter of fact, we preached about it this morning, didn't we? About that glory cloud. There is that cloud that led them, the Shekinah glory of God, and there was that cloud. And, and, here's, and here's what you have in churches. You have try, churches, are you listening tonight, trying to work that up. They're trying to soup it up and work it up. This, and, and, it's, and, and it's not God. It's man-made. It's man-centered. It's man-focused. It's man-glorified. And it's nothing more than just a dusty cloud that's carried along by the wind. As a matter of fact, you can look at verse number 18, and you can take it up with Simon Peter if you don't like it. He pretty much calls him in verse 18 a bunch of windbags. Verse 18, notice he says... For when they speak great swelling words of vanity. It's empty. But man, some of them have nine jointed words. Words I don't even know how to pronounce, amen. But boy, they just great swelling words. And, you know, and, 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 by the, and by the way, can I just remind this of this tonight? Jesus was simple. Amen. Some people say this, well, you know. Oh, so and so, we go to that church. He's so spiritual, we didn't even understand a word he said. <laughs> well, friend, just because, just because he spoke a word, you don't understand a word. Hey, listen, you know what the Bible says? The common people gladly receive Jesus. But their dusty clouds speaks of deception. The disappointment of dry wells, the deception of dusty clouds. Then look again in verse 17. He says they're headed for deep darkness. Notice where that ends in verse 17. The second part of verse 17, he says, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. You know where they're going, friends? Hell. That's where they're headed. They are headed to hell. This darkness is is hell. Well, don't turn there, but let me give you a verse. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 12, the Bible says, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The D word that I like for you to write down beside the deep darkness is the word damnation. Disappointment, dry wells. Deception, dusty clouds. Damnation, Deep darkness. Peter here describes these apostles, or these apostates, excuse me, that way, the explanation of false teachers. May I, I give you a second thought tonight as we have four thoughts to consider tonight as Peter describes these. First of all, number one, not only the explanation of false teachers, but number two tonight, consider with me the enticement of false teachers. Peter explains it in verse 17, and then he says how they entice in verse 18. If you look at verse number 18, you say, Pastor, how in the world did they get following? They do. They get a following. Some of them get great followings. Look at verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, notice this word, and I have this word underlined in my Bible, and it's the word allure. They allure through how? The lust of the flesh. Through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. The word of Lord. I'd like for you to see that word. You know what the word of Lord means? 
It means to catch the bait. So I needed my son for an illustration for this tonight. I said, son, I need me a fishing pole. And he brought me one of his fishing poles. All right, here's one of his fishing poles, all right? And it's even got a lure on it, which I appreciate. I needed that tonight. And uh, so let's talk about that tonight. Let's talk about this alluring that the Bible says this enticement of these apostates and false teachers. Can I show you something real quickly? The word beguiling in verse 14, do you see the word beguiling? Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. The word beguiling in verse 14 is the same word allure in verse 18. He speaks of how they get their converts. And may I just say this tonight, that Satan is not just interested in casualties, although he is. He's also interested in converts. Learn that. He wants converts. So he speaks of how these false prophets get their converts. And they do it like a fisherman who goes fishing. So let's notice some things with that analogy in mind. Notice letter A under this second point. Notice the bait. What bait do they use, Pastor, to get their converts? Well, the bait, according to verse 18, if you notice it, is the lust of the flesh. Lust of the flesh. Friend, you will find in their churches that they are flesh centers. The music is fleshly. Everything about it is flesh, flesh, flesh. The lust of the flesh. You see, a false teacher knows the power of the flesh. And, and it is a powerful thing, is it not? It's not all powerful, but it sure is powerful. The appetite of the old nature. Hold your place here in Peter and go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Would you like to see... I should have had Evan do this tonight. I didn't ask him to do this, so it's not his fault, it's mine. But I want you to go to Galatians chapter 5, and I want you to see what's in Satan's bait bucket. I had a bait bucket here tonight. Uh, we, we, could, we could say, uh, you know, I got some worms, or got some minnows, or I got different things, maybe got some crickets. If I'm going to catch fish, I'm going to, I'm going to have me some bait. Well, I want you to see, according to Galatians chapter number 5, it gives us the devil's bait bucket. How does, how does the devil lure uh, people in and, and, and how does he get them? Well, Galatians chapter 5 and look at verse number 19. He says, now the works, we're talking about the works of the flesh. And of course, we're understanding that according to 2 Peter chapter number 2, he says uh, that they uh, allure through the lusts of the flesh. These false prophets lure their uh, victims or converts uh, through the flesh, all right? So with that in mind, uh, what, what does the flesh look like? Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, all right? You want to know, if you want to know uh, what, what is a description of a flesh-filled person, here's what it is, all right? So he gives us this list. Of course, adultery, what is that? That is any uh, any uh, 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 union outside of marriage, uh, any uh, uh, sexual thing outside of marriage, fornication, anything before marriage, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All right? So here are these things, and these uh, folks are caught by the bait of sensual lust. They are filled uh, with uh, the flesh. All right? Now, letter B, and if you will, go back with me to our text. The second Peter chapter number two. And I want you to see this, all right? So if the bait is the lust of the flesh, what is the tackle? I mean, how do they, I mean, you don't just, you, you gotta hide, you gotta hide the, the hook, right? You don't walk up to a fish and say, hey, got a hook for you. 
Now you've got to hide it. So notice, if you would, in verse number 18, they delivered that bait, which is the lust of the flesh. The tackle is, look at verse 18, 2 Peter 2, verse 18. Notice this phrase, great swelling words. Great swelling words. They deliver the bait with great swelling words, right? Because, you, again, you got to hide the book, all right? So what these people are is, is they are masters of manipulation. They know how to talk. They know how to hide what they are doing. Look at back at verse number three. We've already studied this, but this stays right in context. Look back at chapter two, verse three. And through covetousness shall they, notice this, with feigned words. How many remember what the word feigned means from what we studied before? And it's the word plastos, where we get our word plastic from. All right, that's the word for the word feigned. That's the great word plastos. Feigned words, notice this now, make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. All right? So notice this. They are great swelling words. In other words, these people, many of them are silver tongued. Many of these people uh, have, have a, are, are able to communicate well. I mean, they, they talk so smooth. They, uh, you know, old doctor, uh, old doctor sounding brass is a good preacher. Old doctor, uh, pastor tinkling cymbal, he keep you spellbound for hours. Can I remind you, turn with me to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2? The apostle Paul, when he preached, he didn't preach to impress. He preached to express. He did not preach for manipulation. He preached for regeneration. 1 Corinthians, here's Paul's testimony in chapter 2 and verse number 4. 1 Corinthians 2, 4. Notice that he says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and the power. You see, Paul didn't preach with great swelling words. But when he preached, friend, you can mark her down. The Holy Spirit took it home to the heart. Now, number three, under this second point, as we go back to 2 Peter chapter 2. I said, number one, the bait was the lust of the flesh. And again, you go to their church band, and they are just flesh, 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 flesh. Number two, the tap was great swelling words. Number three, What's the fish? Who's the fish? I mean, we're talking about you know, bass, bluegill, crappie. Evan, the other day, tried for the first time, mahi-mahi. Said he's not impressed. He's going back to salmon. Now, what's the fish? What's the fish here? Are you listening? Look at verse 14. The fish are unstable souls. See, they're not grounded. Verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin... Beguiling unstable souls, at heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Look at verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they are lured through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. You know who these people prey on? Not P R A Y, P R E Y. You know who they prey on? New converts, seeking people, searching people. They'll find them. And with their swelling words and with their lust of flesh and with all of these things, they will, uh, they will uh, dupe these people in. I told you before, I led a lady to the Lord one day and I was all excited. And I told her, I said, I'll, I'll follow up on you this afternoon. I'll bring, I'll, I think Nikki was out on bus visitation that day. And, I had somebody with me, and I said, I'd like to bring my wife by. I'd like to talk to you more about the Lord and growing in the Lord. And that afternoon, right? Listen, she got saved that morning. And that afternoon, this false religious cult family member of hers was at her house. She never did come to church. You know, I, I told her, I said, you know what? I did tell her this. I thought, well, might as well say it. She, 
you know, get one chance. I said, you know what's sad? I said, where was that person's concern for your soul all these years? And they prey on them, don't they? Here was this person that was seeking. Here was that person that was searching. Folks, that's why it's important. Are you listening tonight? That's why it's important when we see someone get saved. It's very important to stabilize them. Don't say, well, you know what? They got saved. You know, check the box. No, listen. Our, our job is not ending when we get someone saved. Our job is just beginning. To see them grounded. To see them stabilized. Because here's a person and they're seeking. And, 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 and you're talking to them. And maybe they're saved. Or maybe you just led them to Christ. And, and all this and that. And they're trying to cross all this. And they're seeking. They want the Lord. But they don't know what it's all about. And, and all of these things. And, 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 and here you are. Listen, you need to ground them. Hey, I'll be by to get you at Sunday, in time for Sunday school. Let's be in Sunday school. Let's be Sunday morning. Let's be Sunday night. Let's be Wednesday night. Hey, come out with us on Sunday afternoon. You can be my partner. We'll go door to door. Hey, we'll, we'll talk. We'll, we'll get in the Word of God. We'll have a, a time in the Word of God. You stabilize them how important that is. These are unstable souls. No wonder Second if Peter ends his epistle here. If you look at chapter 3 and verse 18, no wonder Peter uh, uh, ends this epistle this way, but grow in grace in chapter 3 and verse 18. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing. If you don't grow, if you don't get stabilized, hey, listen, there's a chance you're going to get a hook in your jaw. There's a chance you're going to get a hook in your jaw if you are not stabilized. Number three tonight. I said number one, the explanation of false teachers. Number two, the enticement of false teachers. Number three, would you notice with me, the enslavement of false teachers. Very late, verse 19 is a very important verse because Peter says they promised <coughs> liberty. Look at verse 19. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. And can I tell you what these people preach? Have it your way. Oh, you have liberty in Christ. Brother Frank, we believe in grace in this church. Now, not the Bible kind, of course. I'm a smooth talker, remember? So, Frank, let me tell you, the grace that I'm talking about, brother, is just do whatever you want. Live any way you want, because God is a God of grace. I'm not doing a good job, am I? It's hard to hold this smile. It's so real. Oh, it's so real. Oh, I just... <laughs> Liberty. These plastic false preachers come with a message of freedom. But let me remind you tonight, the devil is not trying to set you free. He's trying to enslave you. Again, the devil doesn't just want casualties. He wants converts. He wants slaves. If you study chapter 3, notice, and, and you'll find out what, a, uh, what some of these are, are slaves to. He says in chapter 3, verse 14, some of these false preachers are slaves to money. In chapter 3, verses 10 and 14, they're slaves to the lust of the flesh. And by the way, it's interesting whether you read in Jude or whether you read in here. It's interesting almost... Almost all the time, almost all the time, interlinked with that apostasy is sexual immorality. Friend, it's like heads and tails of the same coin. They are slaves to pride in verses 10 through 12. And they talk to you about setting you <coughs> free and giving you liberty. But put it down, sin always promises freedom. But it always brings bondage. Friend, that's been true for 6,000 years, hasn't it? 
Adam and Eve, <laughs> you'll be his gods. Think of the liberty that you have. Think of the freedom that you have. Hmm? Did it bring freedom? It did not brought bondage. Can I remind you tonight that the deceivableness of sin is such that those who are in the deepest bondage think they're free. They think we're in bondage. Friend, Jesus is the only one that gives true freedom. John 8, 36, if the Son, capital S-O-N, therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Say, Pastor, what's the difference between the freedom that Jesus gives and the freedom the devil offers? Well, the devil offers for you to do what you want. Have it your way. People think that is freedom, but friend, that is the worst kind of bondage. The freedom that Jesus gives, don't miss this tonight, the freedom the devil offers is for you to do what you want. The freedom Jesus gives is the freedom to do as you ought. Did you hear that? Those who do, not, those who do as they want aren't free at all. They are slaves to corruption. He said, well, preacher, I'm free to do my own thing. Yeah, you are. You're free to choose, but you're not free to choose the consequences of your choice. You're free tonight to go in the tallest building in Butler, however tall that is. Let's say it's 12 stories. And you're free tonight to jump out. Free to do that, aren't you? But let me tell you what. You're not going to defy gravity, friend. You're going to demonstrate it. Amen? The law of gravity is undefeated. And friend, I can tell you this. Once you make that choice, then your choice done chose for you. Right? Gravity takes over and your freedom ends. You must make a choice. If you refuse Jesus Christ, you've already chosen the devil. No, I'm not choosing Satan. Well, if you not choose Christ, you have chosen Satan. Number four and finally, because let's get to the hard and final the part of the message. Number four tonight is the entanglement of false teachers. Bible word here, let's look at it in verse 20 and 21. Number one, the explanation. Number two, the enticement. Number three, the enslavement. Number four now, the entanglement of false teachers. Verse 20, he says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again, notice the word, entangled, there it is, where I get my fourth mess, fourth point from. They are entangled therein and overcome. And notice this, the latter end is worse with them than, than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. Think of the powerful words here. That after they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Notice the word entanglement in verse 20. The word entanglement has the idea of weaving into a garment. When it gets there, they're worse off. Are you listening? They are worse off. Did you hear that? They are worse off than if they had never heard the gospel. When you get someone who's in this state, I didn't say impossible, but I would say they are almost impossible to win. To win. When they have seen the truth, and deliberately, knowingly said, no, I'm going that way. God says they're entangled. Notice this. The apostate has heard the gospel. He has refused the gospel. He opposes the gospel. And then he tries to replace the gospel. He's not neutral. Notice verse 21. He says, they have known the way of righteousness. But notice the word in verse 21. I have it underlined in my Bible, and it's the word turn. Notice the word turn there. Again, we're not talking about someone who just drifts away. We are talking, are you listening tonight? Let's say this podium uh, is, is a picture of the truth. Are you listening tonight? These are folks who know the truth. They have seen the truth. And are you listening? Here's what they do. Turn. They turn. This is a deliberate Decision. They do this willfully. Listen, the people we're preaching about tonight, these people are not deceived. They are willfully, I've already said that, they are willfully wicked. Let me give you a principle tonight. When you live by the truth of the word of God, God gives you freedom. 
The longer you study, the more you learn, the more you obey of the Word of God, the more freedom you enter into. But when you deliberately choose against the truth, don't miss this, when you deliberately go against the truth, you go deeper and deeper into bondage. And you are worse off, according to the Word of God, you are worse off than a person who has never heard the truth. It would have been better for you to have never known the way of truth. Let me give you a, a Bible illustration of this. Turn me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 12, please. <laughs> Matthew chapter 12. Serious business. Peter here is not mixing words. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 43. The Bible says in Matthew 12, verse 43, Jesus said, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Wow. So I tell you tonight that reformation without regeneration and transformation leads to degradation and finally condemnation. I'll say that again. Reformation without regeneration and transformation leads to greater degradation and final condemnation. You see, if we go back and we finish out here in 2 Peter chapter 2, this is not, it, it may seem like these people when you're studying them, it may seem like these are people who were saved and then quote unquote lose their salvation. No, they never had it. They never had it. They reformed for a while. They're, they're a group of people that says, you know, I've been living wrong and I'm going to do right. I'm going to go, I'm going to get me some religion. I'm going to get me a church. I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. But they never get saved and they never had a change of nature. They never had a new birth. They had religion without reality. They had culture without Calvary. They have a creed. They have a code. They have a cause. They have a church. But they don't have Calvary. And they don't have Christ. And then you know what happens to them? They run out of gas. Because are you ready? They tried that. You heard that? We've heard it, haven't we? Well, I tried that. Yeah, that's your problem. You tried instead of trusting it. They run out of gas and so well, I tried that for two days, two weeks, two months. Doesn't work. And they turn from Christ and they go their own way. And you know what verse 21, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 21, you know what the Bible says here in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 21 says? They're the hardest in the world to reach. Look at verse 21. The Bible says it had been better for them, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. And with that in mind, now look at verse 22. And here's what Peter says they're like. Verse 22, he says, But it happened unto them according to the true proverb. You know, not all Proverbs are true. Of course, all the ones the Word of God are, but you understand what I'm saying. Breaking news. Everything you read on the fortune cookie is not true. Amen. <laughs> but this is a true Proverb. Notice this. The dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed of her wallowing in the mire. Notice God, can I say this tonight? God calls his people as sheep. God never calls his people dogs and hogs. Amen. By the way, in Bible times, if you were called a dog, you know, we, we kind of have a sound in awe. 
Friend, I can tell you this. When God called someone dogs, they weren't saying, aww. They called the Gentiles dogs. That wasn't a compliment. They called the Sodomites dogs. And that wasn't a compliment. In verse 22, he talks about a sick dog. I know y'all getting ready to go out after church tonight, but I'll go and give you the illustration anyways. You know what a dog does? A dog eats something, right? You got some dogs, don't you? Dog will eat something. You know what that dog would do if it doesn't agree with it, Brother Ray? That's what he does. And that'll bless him. Then you know what that dog does, Brother Frank? Because it's his nature. That dog looks at that and says, that don't look half bad. <laughs> it's still warm. I don't even have to put it in the microwave, amen? Laps it up. You say, Pastor, that's disgusting. Peter meant it to be. Yep. And then he talks about a pig. You know what you can do with a pig? You can take it out of the pig pen. You can scrub it. You can wash it. You can perfume it. You can even put a pink ribbon around his neck. Put him in a mansion. You know what that pig's going to do, Brother Ray? I mean, he's in the finest home in the, in, in, in the state. You know what he's going to do? He's going to look out that window. He's going to say, boy, that mud hole looks good. Here you are, pig. You're washed. You're perfumed. You're clean. You're in the nicest house in the state. And if we let you out, you'd be like, <laughs> right back to the mud hole. See, the dog was cleaned in. The pig was cleaned out. The dog felt better. The pig looked better. But are you listening tonight? The pig was still a pig. And the dog was still a dog. And the reason they both went back, are you listening? Is because they were still what they were. He said, oh, preacher, I know someone who was saved and they're no longer saved. No, friend. You know someone who was regurgitated but not regenerated. You probably know someone that was scrubbed but wasn't saved. Here's three questions and I'm done. Number one, are you saved? Are you saved? Amen? Are you saved? Well, my dad, my no, no, no. Do you have a Bible reason for going there? Are you saved? Question number two. Are you stable? Are you getting in this book every day and knowing what you believe and why you believe from the book? This crowd looks for unstable souls. You better know what you believe and why you believe it from the word of God. And number three, are you surrendered? Am I surrendered? Or am I going to look at the truth of God's word tonight and turn from it? Or am I going to say, that's what God says. That's what I'll do. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads bowed and our eyes are closed tonight.